Happy Sabbath Church. A warm welcome everyone to Canberra National Church this morning. Also, I wish you a happy and blessed Sabbath. Now, uh, this morning, I'll be taking you on a very long journey, a journey of uh, 6,000 years, all the way from Eden uh, lost to Eden regained in, in the end. Uh, my only prayer is that I won't take as long to retell the t story to you this morning. Um, it's uh, the story about God's undeserved kindness, his grace towards us. And I found that uh, one key that keeps the story together all the way through the scripture is the key of the temple, the story of the temple. And uh, when we sort of look at that story, uh, we can uh, put together uh, the history of salvation as we find it in the, in the Bible. And uh, Elon Musk may uh, take you on an exciting journey into outer space, but uh, the journey through Scripture is a far more exciting one, and it involves your life and my life. Um, we have the picture of Eden, and that's where it all starts. God created a perfect world for man to live in forever. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, man decided that uh, he would forfeit his noble position and give over his dominion to Satan. And ever since then, the earth has been under the cruel mastership of Satan himself the evil and the unjust rule that he gives. Adam and Eve uh, found out too late that they'd made a mistake. And so they wondered if there was possibility, a possibility of getting back again. Their sin had caused a separation between themselves and God. They were cast out of the Garden of Eden, and we are told in Genesis 3.24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So they realize now that their sin has separated them from God. And you know, every day in Eden, uh, Eden of course was a separate place, a special place in the world uh, separate from the world, it was a, a garden that God had built for them and it was in that special place that, garden, that God communed with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening as the Bible puts it. But now that communion had been disrupted and uh, man was now outside and he was wondering whether he could come back in again. And um, it was at this point that the story of grace begins. God had anticipated this beforehand and as soon as it happened he introduced uh, the story of grace right there in the Garden of Eden. You see, uh, God had to make intelligent beings and give them the freedom of choice. That choice had to be a real one. Um, an intelligent God can't make robots and the robots come to him every Sabbath uh, and automatically say, God, you're a great God and we love you and we praise your name. What kind of God would get joy out of that kind of thing? Not even a human being would get joy out of that with robots coming to him every morning and saying how great you are uh, if they are programmed to do that way. So in order for the government of God to operate on the basis of love, there had to be freedom of choice. And that freedom of choice had to be a genuine one. So that uh, man could indeed uh, choose to rebel against God if he wanted to. Lucifer had made that choice in heaven. There had been war in heaven. And now here on earth, mankind, Adam and Eve, our first parents, had made the choice to join the ranks of Satan and rebel against God 
and so they came under his dominion. But to get back, God did two things. Number one, he spoke a word, and number two, he did something. The words that he spoke were words that he spoke to the serpent, and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So here in this first covenant promise of God, uh, we have the contents of the whole of scripture outlined for us. The first and the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, who is the seed of the woman, the singular seed. In the beginning it is a plural seed, but when it gets to the part where it says, he will crush your head, it's referring to one single seed of the woman. And um, so this singular seed would crush the head of the serpent at the end of time, the second coming of Jesus, but the serpent would strike the heel of that seed at the cross of Calvary. So here the first and the second coming of Jesus are outlined for us in that first covenant promise. The contents of scripture and the contents of the plan of salvation have been given to us. The second thing that God did was an action, Genesis 3 verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So right here in the Garden of Eden, even before they were cast out, uh, God sacrificed an animal and gave the clothing uh, skins to Adam and Eve to cover the shame of their nakedness as Bible describes it. Of course, it wasn't just physical nakedness that they were ashamed of. It was the sin that they had committed that revealed to them their nakedness. And uh, these garments were not only meant to cover their physical bodies, but also the sin that they had committed. So here are two things um, that God has given to us. Uh, the dark clouds came after Adam and Eve had sinned. And uh, he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Um, this offspring is in the plural, but then when it comes to this offspring here, it's a singular uh, seed that does the work of crushing the serpent's head. The Lord God made garments of, for, of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The first idea of the imputed righteousness of Jesus covering our sin and making us acceptable to God was right there in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. We have the story continuing then uh, with Cain and Abel, the uh, forefathers of all true and all false religion. Abel comes to God with the sacrifice of the lamb and Cain comes to God to worship God in all sincerity we believe uh, with the wheat, he was an agronomist, so he brought the wheat and the vegetation that he was working with in the land as an offering to God. But Cain's offering is not accepted by God, and yet Abel's offering is accepted. So why is God so particular? Uh, Cain gets so mad over this issue that he kills his brother. The same thing that's going to happen at the end of time. Um, so yes, I think behind, the issue behind all this is how we come to God and how we worship God. Do we worship God on our terms or do we worship God on his terms? That is the difference between all false and all true religion. Are we going to re <coughs> search scripture and find out what God has revealed to us in scripture and fit our lives according to that? Or are we going to establish truth within ourselves and say, well, uh, this is the way I think, this is what's true for me, and uh, God must just accept that. So uh, that's the difference between Cain and Abel. We fast track 1,500 years uh, to Noah and the antediluvians. The Bible also commits only one chapter to those 1,500 years of history. 
and uh, it's all bad history. Mankind is going down and down and down until we are told in Genesis that the thoughts of the human heart were evil continually and the world was full of violence. So God brings it to an end with the flood, but he saves Noah, the only righteous man that he can find who responds in faith. And for the first time in the Bible, we hear the word altar. Noah builds an altar after he comes out of the ark, and on that altar he sacrifices uh, the animals that, uh, the clean, some of the clean animals that were in the ark with him. So again, the idea of coming back to God, we can only do it with the slain lamb. Without the slain lamb, we cannot come back to God. Uh, that's the basic idea of the plan of salvation that God gives. And so it's true that as we go, uh, there's old Noah with uh, the altar that he builds, and uh, we fast forward again to the time of Abraham, uh, 1800 BC more or less, and uh, everywhere where Abraham went, he built an altar, and again he sacrificed the lamb on those altars, representing the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Of course, um, Abraham was a man of faith and uh, he responded and uh, did according to what God had indicated in, 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 his, uh, in his communication with him. We fast track again to, uh, to Mount Sinai, uh, the descendants of Abraham, uh, Jacob, his grandson, went down into Egypt with his 12 sons and their families, and there they were for 400 years, and God sends Moses to bring them out of Egypt and to take them to the promised land. And uh, here at the bottom of Mount Sinai, uh, God does two things once again. Uh, he gives the law, uh, the Ten Commandments, which uh, Kofi read so well over here, Thank you, Kofi, for, for reading that for us. Uh, so now we all know what the Ten Commandments are. And also he gave instructions as to how they were to worship God. And uh, this is all spelled out in the, uh, in the uh, tabernacle that God instructed them to do at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, strangely enough, even though God specifically says that the tabernacle that uh, Moses was to make in the wilderness is patterned after a heavenly original, we also see that it is patterned after the Garden of Eden. Uh, just as in the Garden of Eden you have uh, the presence of God uh, in a special way, Adam and Eve, when they wanted to commune with God, they came to the Garden. And it was there that they communed with God every day, and it was that that they were missing the most, by the way. Uh, there's also the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. There were the cherubim with the flaming sword, preventing uh, Adam and Eve from coming back. And um, there is also the river. In fact, there were four rivers in the Garden of Eden, the Euphrates, the Tigris, uh, the Pishon, and, and the Gishon. Uh, so there were rivers there as well. And we find that in the tabernacle and the temple as well, uh, it is very much patterned after that. There is the presence of God over there. And then we have the two curtains, uh, one in front of the holy place and the second curtain in front of the most holy place. And these curtains were embroidered with what? With the cherubim reminding us of the cherubim at the gates of the Garden of Eden. And uh, the cherubim uh, are saying to mankind, you can't approach God because you have sin. You've got the problem of sin. And uh, you are stopped from approaching God. The sanctuary service, only the priests could go in uh, to, uh, to make their, their deliberations inside over here. And, and not the ordinary member. So we have things happening over here. The story of salvation is being uh, expounded to us. First of all, we still have the lamb that is slain. Uh, we have two living things, the priest and the lamb. The lamb doesn't last for too long before he gets killed over here at the altar. 
The priest then takes the blood of that lamb uh, and brings it into the uh, sanctuary service and uh, sprinkles it before the curtain over there. So we have the idea that um, the only way the priest can come in here is with the blood of the lamb. He can't approach God without having the blood of the lamb with him, covering the sin of the uh, penitent sinner over here. This man who brings the lamb as an offering to God uh, slays the lamb. This animal that had nothing to do with his sin uh, must now die for his sin. There's a substitute. The lamb is dying in place of me. Now, I should have died there, but the lamb is dying. God is providing a substitute over there. And uh, the high priest, these two things, the lamb and the high priest, are the means by which God has ordained for mankind to get back to God again. Uh, you also see the, the lamb stand over here. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. There's the table of showbread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. There's the altar of incense, the prayers of the saints going up to God. And, uh, and then inside the most holy place, um, we have uh, the Ark of the Covenant, um, which is this box over here. And guess what, Kofi, what was kept in here? The Ten Commandments. Uh, and the, the lid of this ark, which is the only piece of furniture inside the most holy place, was called the mercy seat. So here we have another two things. Uh, first we had the priest and the lamb, but over here we have the commandments of God and the mercy seat. Uh, some say that uh, the commandments of God have been done away with, uh, and we're now living under grace. But that's impossible because uh, if you do away with the commandments, if you do away with the law, you've done away with justice. And God is a God of justice. I'm glad that he is a God of justice and not chaos. But the, he is a God of justice. But he is also a God of mercy, the mercy seat. Before we arrive at the law, before we arrive at justice, we are dealing with the mercy of God first. And then we arrive at uh, the law of God. So we're get beginning to sort of uh, flesh out what is happening to uh, how God is thinking and how he wants us to respond to him in faith. Um, right. Um, let's go on now to uh, Mount Gerizim. After the ark, the... Um, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, as you know. They crossed over the Jordan with Joshua. Joshua conquered the land of the Canaanites. And uh, the first thing he does after conquering the land of Canaan, he goes to Mount Gerizim to worship God. You can understand now why Jesus, when he was talking to the woman at the well, uh, how why the Samaritans look upon Mount Gerizim as the place for worship, because that was the first place Joshua went to worship. Um, across the valley from Mount Gerizim is Mount Ebal, and Joshua split the twelve tribes into six each onto each side of the hill, and they called across to each other the blessings and the cursings of the covenant. If we obey God, all these blessings will come. But if we, obey, if we disobey and walk away from God, then all, the, all these bad things will happen. So that, was, that happened at Mount Gerizim. Also in the valley there is the uh, town of Shechem. And that was the place where Abraham first came and built an altar in the land of Canaan. And not too far from that is Sychar, just down over here. And that is uh, where Jacob built a well. And that is where the woman at the well was waiting. And Jesus spoke to her and they discussed about... Uh, and she said, well, we Samaritans worship here in Mount Gerizim, but you worship in Jerusalem, which is the right place. So God, Jesus said, well, neither. Uh, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So um, um, that's interesting there. Um, just to re recap when um, the... Um, when Moses dedicated the, the tabernacle, uh, 
a supernatural light, which the Jewish people call the Shekinah glory, uh, descended and filled the most holy place and took its place above the cherubim, above the ark. It was actually the presence of God in a very real, tangible way right there. And it remained there for the time that they were in the wilderness. When they came out and the land was conquered, uh, Joshua didn't choose Shechem uh, as the place to worship, but he uh, chose Shiloh over there as the place to put the tent and the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, during the time of the judges, we're not too sure how much worship happened at this place, whether the people went there to worship God or not, we're not too sure. It's only just now, every now and then, that we hear of a mention of, the Shil of, of Shiloh, except at the end of that 400 years of existence of the tent uh, at Shiloh, something drastic happened. And we know the story of um, how Eli, who was an old man by now, he was the priest, um, he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were up to no good. Uh, they, were operating, they were operating as priests of the tent at Shiloh, the, the tabernacle, and they were doing all sorts of bad things. Uh, and uh, God warned Eli that it's not going to last for too long and disaster will come. And uh, they didn't listen, they just carried on and got even worse in fact. And finally the day of accounting came when the Philistines gathered on the other side and decided to do battle with the Israelites. Well, they went into battle and the Israelites lost 4,000 men. And uh, then they got together and decided, listen, uh, let's take the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle and we will take that in front of the army and God will win the battle for us. Well, they didn't even pray about it, neither were they very religious people. But they were thinking back of the time of Joshua when he went, went around the walls of Jericho and the Ark of the Covenant went ahead and the walls of Jericho just fell down and they conquered uh, the city. And so they brought the Ark of the Covenant out and uh, when the Philistines heard about that, they got a huge big fright. They trembled with fear, it says in the Bible. Uh, because they remembered even 400 years previous uh, how Moses had come out of Egypt, went to the Red Sea, the, the ten plagues, and the whole story, it was fresh in the mind of the Philistines. And they knew that here is trouble because the, the real God is with them. Well, he wasn't on this occasion because uh, uh, they hadn't asked God for direction. They hadn't been praying to him. They hadn't been doing the right things in the tabernacle. And so they engage in battle, and this time 40,000 Israelites are killed, and the ark is, uh, is captured. Um, a messenger runs back to Eli and tells him what, ha what has happened. Hophni and Phinehas have been killed and uh, the ark has been captured. Eli gets such a fright he falls over backward, hits his head on a stone and dies. Uh, Phinehas's wife who's pregnant goes into labor and uh, she gives birth to a baby boy but she dies uh, soon afterwards and the baby boy is called Ichabod the glory has departed. And uh, the glory has, that Shekinah glory, the presence of God, had departed and had left uh, them to their own ways. You see, the whole story is not that God says, listen, if you don't worship me and obey me and follow me, I'm going to kill you. No, that's not the story. Um, we gave our allegiance to Satan in the beginning. We're lost already. We're in his dominion. We're doomed to die already. What God is offering is life. And um, he's saying, my kingdom is a kingdom of life for eternity. But uh, if you want to go to Satan, his kingdom is death forever. Please make your choice, but please choose life. That's the story. That's the true story. So uh, we carry on with our story, and we need to... Uh, uh, probably haste on a little bit. Which way do I point this thing? Here we go. Thanks. 
um, the building of the temple, um, which uh, was built during the time of Solomon. Uh, David was not privileged to, uh, to, to build the temple for God because he was a man with blood on his hand. He had uh, uh, killed many men in battle, and so the building of the temple went to Solomon. And uh, if, you, if you take all the materials of gold and silver and everything else that went into the building of uh, the temple, David himself collected all the materials and prepared everything. All that Solomon had to do was to, to build. And in today's terms, if you, if you turn to the book of Chronicles and work out the amount of gold and silver and bronze and everything else, the cost of building the temple of Solomon runs into the billions of dollars. Runs into the multiple billions of dollars. Work it out for yourself and uh, tell me what uh, price you come to. It's an interesting story. So here we have um, Solomon praying at the dedication of the temple. And um, he prays about many things. He prays about the wrongs that people do to their neighbor. He prays about uh, what happens when the enemy defeats us or when the enemy besieges us. Drought, famine, plague, blight, locusts, uh, the foreigner, and everything. And at the end of each one, uh, Solomon says in his prayer, Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And he says that that's a refrain that he keeps on saying right throughout his prayer. So now we know really that the temple was really meant to be a place of forgiveness of sins for everyone, not just Israel or, or uh, special people, but for the whole world as they looked to the, this great beautiful temple of Solomon and as they might have traveled to come and see this one of the wonders of the world, uh, they would find the gospel right there in the temple. And uh, as a result of that, they could give their lives to God and become disciples of his. Um, with the dedication of the temple, uh, the Shekinah glory again came into the temple and rested over the Ark of the Covenant and stayed over there. So this very real presence, the supernatural light, uh, comes in and uh, occupies the temple there as well. But we hasten on and um, we see that um, at the end of the first temple, which lasted about 400 years, uh, we're now looking at uh, 586 BC, uh, when the uh, temple was uh, destroyed. You remember our lessons in Ezra and Nehemiah. And um, we are again looking at a bad situation. The people of God have apostatized. They've gone away from God and uh, they are in serious trouble. In fact, what they are doing is that they are sacrificing their own children in the Valley of Hinnom, just south of the city of Jerusalem. They had child baby roasters there in the valley. They had brought in idols right into the temple itself and were worshipping those idols inside the temple. And they were saying, God won't see, God can't see, and God won't hear. Um, we have a lot of things. God was, uh, if, you, if you see the amount of biblical material that there is around the exile, there's Isaiah, there's Jeremiah, there's Ezekiel, there's Daniel. Uh, there's uh, coming out, there's Ezra, there's Nehemiah, there's Haggai, there's Zechariah. There's so much prophets, so many prophets that God was sending to his people to try and bring them, bring them back again. And uh, they just would not listen. Um, an interesting story is Ezekiel. He's quite an eccentric character. Uh, he, um, he was taken as a prisoner into exile in, in the second attack on Jerusalem in 597 BC. And when he was taken, uh, together with Mordecai, by the way, Mordecai of Esther fame, uh, he, they went into exile. He was not a prophet at that time, but he only became a prophet 
in Babylon when he was beside the Kibo River, remember, and he sees this vision of God in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. Well, <coughs> Ezekiel had another vision. He's sitting there in, in Babylon and he says, uh, he's in vision, he says, I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire, and from there up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. How do you like that? Here's God stretching out his hand. He grabs Ezekiel by the hair of his head. And what does he do? The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God he took me to Jerusalem. So he takes him all the way to Jerusalem. Come with me, Ezekiel. We're going to go and show you something. <laughs> I find it quite humorous. And uh, Ezekiel, when you read the story, he's quite an eccentric character, and it seems like uh, God was uh, treating him in an, an eccentric way as well, uh, just to be at, uh, on the same page uh, as Ezekiel. But when he gets to Jerusalem, he sees all these idols there inside the temple. He sees the men who are responsible. He names them. And then he says... Uh, then the glory of the Lord rose above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. He sees the Shekinah glory lifting up from, uh, the, from the Ark of the Covenant and uh, it goes to the threshold of the temple, the, the doorway. And he says, these were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kibo River, and I realized that they were cherubim. He's seeing this in vision, all right? And he's seeing the living cherubim, not the ones that are embroidered on the curtains uh, or over the Ark of the Covenant. But he's seeing the living cherubim, the four that seem to carry the presence of God around. He then says in, his, in verse 18, Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. And then further on, it, they stop, uh, it stops over the entrance of the eastern gate to the temple precinct. And then he says, finally, the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. So the Shekinah glory was slowly withdrawing from the temple from the threshold to outside to the gate and then to the top of the Mount of Olives and it's as, it's as if God is reluctant to go. He doesn't want to go but he's been forced to go. He has no choice because of man's choice. So um, the end of that was that we know that Jerusalem fell in 586 BC. Nebuchadnezzar took them all to uh, to Babylon as slaves and they had to walk the distance between Jerusalem and Babylon a distance of 1,500 kilometers as slaves they couldn't go across straight across over here because it's complete desert over here and so they had to follow uh, the route of the rivers and so that end of the story of the first temple is a sad one but then they come back again uh, under, under Zerubbabel and Ezra and uh, when they come back they sing the psalm of ascent, Psalm 126 when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion we were like those who dreamed our mouths were filled with laughter our tongues with songs of joy then it was said among the nations the Lord has done great things for them the Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Wow. So they came back to make another start, another clean start. And, uh, and so they, the, the temple is built. Uh, the man who released them from uh, slavery was this man Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus the Great who conquered the Babylonians and uh, set the captives free to go back home. Uh, how do we know that he looks like this? Well, it comes off the, um, uh, the Cyrus Monument, which is a replica of the monument that there is in Iran. 
Uh, and uh, if you go to the Botanical Gardens in Sydney, uh, you'll find a replica of uh, the monument right there. And this is what I took uh, in the gardens there in Sydney, uh, the replica of the monument for Cyrus. And he is described in the Bible as the Messiah. He's, uh, he's another Messiah, just as Jesus was described as Messiah, so is Cyrus. So he becomes a type of Jesus who sets his people free to go home uh, and to, to worship God in freedom. That's the tomb of Cyrus the Great and Pasa God uh, uh, in uh, the country of Iran. We come to the temple, the second temple now, which lasted about 600 years. And um, this is a renovation under Herod. It didn't look like this under Ezra and Zerubbabel, but uh, when Herod the Great came, uh, during the time of Jesus, he renovated the temple and, and extended the platform uh, on this side over here to include those buildings there. There's a big drop down there. And, uh, but the Romans were keeping an eye on the whole thing and so they built the Antonia Fortress over here to keep an eye on all the disturbances that Jewish people were making. Uh, and uh, so they built that there. That's where Jesus was tried by Pilate in the Antonia Fortress. Um, if in the first temple the Jewish people had flirted with paganism and had fell into paganism themselves, the second temple period uh, shows that they kept their promise not to ever flirt with paganism ever again, and they kept their promise. Unfortunately, this time in the second temple period, they became so self-righteous and so legalistic that God could not work with them anymore. And that's what Jesus had to face when he came to this earth. So here you see uh, a small uh, wall about that high uh, going along over there and another one on this side over here uh, going on that side. It's called the Sareg. And um, it's got a sign on it saying, Gentiles are not allowed past this point on pain of death. You are the uncircumcised, you are the unclean, and you're not allowed to come any closer than that. Well, what kind of evangelistic, evangelistic campaign is that? Eh? Uh, they were meant to be a blessing. This, this house was meant to be <coughs> a prayer for all people, for all nations. And they were meant to come here and find the gospel here and find life over here at this place and what are they doing? They're keeping them out, saying that they are bad, unclean, dirty, and all the rest of it. Well, the women are allowed to come a bit closer. So, um, uh, as we see in this picture here, uh, this court that's in front of her here, the women were allowed to come in here, but that, that's as far as they were allowed to come. And uh, the men were allowed to go through there into the actual temple precincts itself. Um, and uh, perform the work of the priests. So the whole thing had kind of doubled in on itself and going from one extreme to the other extreme and uh, Jesus uh, had to deal with these things. Jesus said when he cleared the temple out with the whip, remember, he said, uh, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of robbers. Where is it written, that, that quote that Jesus made? It was written by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah had said those words at the end of the first temple. And now Jesus was saying the same words at the end of the second temple. And Jesus says these famous words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Your house is left unto you desolate. What did Jesus mean by that? Jesus was moving away from the temple. It's the last time he moved away from the temple. 
and with it was like the Shekinah glory going away, vacating the premises that no longer could be occupied by God anymore. And uh, so with the leaving of Jesus, the house becomes desolate. In one sense, the second temple was more glorious than the first because it was occupied by this, the second person of the Godhead himself, Jesus Christ our Lord. So uh, Jesus then said in the very next verse, uh, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him and called his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on, the, on another, all will be thrown down. And, uh, and so the destruction of the second temple came about just as thoroughly as the first one was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the second one was destroyed by Titus uh, and his Roman generals. It is said that there were about 600,000 people who died in the conflagration of the second temple. Um, Josephus writes the account, he's the man who was actually there and he was the historian. And uh, his own parents were caught up in the conflagration and were killed. Uh, as he, uh, the, the Romans were killing everybody, there was no mercy. Uh, women, children, uh, men, everyone is just being killed. And uh, as uh, Josephus goes through with them, and who does he see in a group of about 50 people? There's his brother. And so he goes, goes back to Titus and he says, hey, can we just save that group over there? Uh, and of course he tells, he tells Titus the general that that's his brother and so Titus, that was the only mercy extended uh, to those people uh, with uh, Josephus' brother but what did Jesus say? Jesus had warned about this very event he said when, the, when you see the armies encompassing around Jerusalem then now the time is near, you must flee and so a group of Christians under the leadership of a man by the name of Simon, whom we are, we are led to believe was the cousin of Jesus. He leads, he takes this group of Christians who are there, and they go out and flee to a city of Pella across the Jordan River. And they are saved uh, uh, in that conflagration. Why? Because they believed in the words of Jesus and obeyed him. There were false prophets in Jerusalem who were saying, listen, Stay in Jerusalem. Show your faith in God. God is able to deliver you. This is his temple. He's not going to allow any pagan to conquer Jerusalem. Show your faith. Be strong. Or false prophet. So it is uh, that in the um, few days later, Jesus himself is crucified on the cross. And uh, here's God interfering with the Passover feast of the Jews and uh, he's supplying his own sacrifice at the very time that uh, the sacrificial lamb was to die on Calvary's uh, 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 die to be sacrificed was three o'clock in the afternoon and that's the very time that Jesus died uh, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and so justice and mercy have come together and so what happened after Jesus, uh, this is just uh, the, uh, when Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The, uh, the veil split in two from top to bottom. That curtain was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and as thick as uh, four fingers. There's no way that any human being could have torn that. It was torn by God himself. So what, what, what is happening there? Um, we're getting back to the Eden story. The cherubim that are guarding the human beings from getting back to God uh, have been shattered. They've been, they've been pushed aside. And uh, the access and the way back to God, the way back to Eden has been accomplished through the cross of Calvary. So we go on to the new heavenly uh, city which we are told is the temple of God. 
This one is uh, the shape of a cube. It's in heaven, and we are destined for that. It's 2,200 kilometers long, 2,200 kilometers wide, and 2,200 kilometers high. We are told in the book of Revelation uh, 22, I think it is. And um, I don't know if we meant to take that literally or symbolically or what, but I think the main message is that there's plenty of room in heaven. So don't fail to make your booking and come there. But you can only come under the blood of the Lamb of God. And so I'm going to leave you with, um, I think our time is up over here. And so, um, but there is a little song that I'd uh, ask you just to listen to uh, as we close. Uh, we're not allowed to put it on online, so we'll uh, close down the line and, uh, and listen to it uh, on, on, in the building itself.